the moment that defined the chaos of the 21st century. A financial atomic bomb exploded in the heart of the world's banking system, sucking up the lifeblood of the global economy, the credit that keeps the wheels of fortune turning. Banks grown too big to go bust held nations to ransom. Trillions of dollars cascaded into the bankers' vaults. Leaders of the 20 largest economies promised never again. But once again, they betrayed their duty to protect the wealth and the welfare of their people. American dream, a land of freedom and prosperity if you were willing to work. But first, Indians had to be cleared from their homelands, forced off their hunting grounds, herded onto reservations to be controlled. We know the history that we share. It's a history marked by violence and disease and deprivation. Treaties were violated. Promises were broken. You were told your lands, your religion, your cultures, your languages were not yours to keep. For millions of Europe's refugees, this was the start of a new life. Was open. The established eastern settlements and communities offered little opportunity for land ownership. The countryside through the valleys and forests were rich in wild game and black soil and the American pioneer knew how to use both once he had decided on the spot he wanted to settle. But before he could reach his destination, he would have to conquer the weather, wide swollen rivers, high mountains, protect himself, his cattle and his possessions, and fight hostile Indians whose land he was invading. But as the wagon masters led them westwards to the promised land, for many the dream turned into a nightmare. The land was enclosed by the old world aristocracy. Their workers imported from Africa, a labor force captured by slave traders and crated into the great ships that plowed the Atlantic. And the engine of economic growth kept breaking down. Hopes raised by boom times were dashed by busts. American capitalism lurched between production on an awesome scale to the destruction of people's savings and their welfare. Mysteriously, land on a continent of vast spaces was beyond the grasp of millions of families. Landowners considered themselves free of responsibility to their communities. I find that you make your living from being in the real estate business. But when you rent a house, you contract not only between yourself and your tenant, but also with the community. This is the third time that you've been before this court. You had ample time I think that the city has been more than fair in this case. The houses you rent, houses which you do not keep in decent, livable condition, are a menace not only to your tenants, but to the city of Baltimore. Mr. Hallam, I therefore find you guilty, and the fine is $50 and costs. Baltimore, a major port of entry for immigrants to the United States, Refugees attracted to jobs in steel mills, shipbuilding yards, and car manufacturing. But the prosperity was not to last. In the 20th century, even as the Soviet Union yielded to the American superpower, the great industries were in decline, but fortunes were still to be made out of real estate. The first cracks in the New World Order surfaced in poor neighborhoods like this one across America and Europe. People borrowed money to buy homes they couldn't afford. Inevitably, they defaulted on their mortgage repayments, triggering the banking crisis. Subprime mortgages blighted whole neighborhoods. Boarded up houses were vandalized, driving down the value of next door properties. 
banks escaped the oversight needed to protect people who borrowed money. Baltimore's council claims that one bank, Wells Fargo, targeted low-income neighborhoods. When the bust came, foreclosures in African-American streets were three times higher than white neighborhoods. A group of consumers anxious to borrow money and therefore susceptible to the kinds of marketing uh, that Wells Fargo and, and their agents engaged in. The lending and banking institutions, uh, when they drew up contracts with interest rates, with flexible interest rates, I think they knew in the beginning that these problems were going to come back later on where folks weren't going to be able to afford the mortgages as the interest rates increased. It put a lot of people in situations where they were taking food out of refrigerators, taking kids out of higher education. They're not able to afford college anymore. And it is making a really, really bad situation worse. The council plotted the foreclosure of homes on maps. 70% of vacant properties were in African-American streets. These are loans which were made by one of the major lenders in the city and in this country, Wells Fargo, in which Wells Fargo targeted minority communities in the city, uh, put borrowers into loans that they could not afford, put borrowers into loans um, that, that were of the subprime variety, therefore more expensive and less advantageous to the borrowers. We don't get the same opportunities, we don't get the same rates, we don't get the same uh, fixed contracts as the other people, other races of people do in this country. What the banks had was a, the following utopia. They could charge the blacks and the Hispanics a higher interest rate by saying you're risky because you're poor, and at the same time they could get the uh, bond rating agencies to give these AAA ratings, AAA ratings as safe as government, as if there were no risk at all while the banks were charging for risk. The lenders got out of these transactions quickly, Shortly after making the loans, they packaged these loans with other loans and then put them into the secondary market. So Wells Fargo, as the initial lender, no longer had a stake in the action. They and others involved in the original loan got their money up front, and it was somebody else's problem to worry about if and when the foreclosure numbers came in high years down the road, as of course happened. The banks did know the consequences of their action, and we know that because they prepared for it for many years. They prepared for it legally, they prepared for it in uh, the way that they set up the mortgages, they prepared for it in the way that they uh, were able to package the mortgages and sell them on to hapless purchasers. They're not worrying about, they don't, they don't come in the heart of it. Like, you in the heart of it, so you see, they don't really see the struggle if they don't come in the heart of it, they see in the outside of it. That's like looking at the cover of a book and seeing the outside of the seeing the outside of a book. But if you don't go inside the book, then you'll never know what the book about. So they're not worrying about nobody else but themselves. Wells Fargo denies engaging in financial malpractices. Then, overnight, America's banks tipped into bankruptcy. Bankers needed money and they needed it fast. Taxpayers came to the rescue as the illusion of the American dream faded for families who lost their homes and jobs. Our world is in chaos, but we can trace all the social, economic and environmental crises to a common cause, the way we abuse each other in the scramble to monopolise the riches of Earth. But we can't solve these problems while governments conspire with corporations to control other people's natural resources. We economic hitmen have created the world's first truly global empire, and we've done it primarily without the military. We work many different ways. But perhaps the most common is that we'll take a third world country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. However, the money never actually goes to the country. Instead, it goes to our own corporations to build infrastructure projects in that country, power plants, highways, industrial parks, things that benefit a few wealthy families in that country as well as our corporations, but don't help the majority of the people at all. Who are, they're too poor to buy electricity or drive cars on the highways or, or, get, or don't have the skills to get jobs in industrial parks. But they're left holding a huge debt. It's such a big debt that the country can never repay it. And so at some point, we economic hitmen go back in and say, listen, you can't pay your debts, give us a pound of flesh, sell your oil real cheap to oil companies, 
But we won't be able to reform the laws if we allow corporations to compromise the democratic process by buying the privileges that put their profits above the interests of everyone else. Part of democratic processes, the Congress should have a say on the way money gets spent. That's part of democracy. But it's not a reflection of good democracy when a company, a group of companies, an industry, says uh, our interests are more important than the national interest. How can that happen? Very easy. That's the role of campaign contributions, lobbying in, American, uh, in, uh, in America's political structure. Uh, we have a flawed democracy. Not an accident, for instance, that we had the deregulation in our financial industry that was such a disaster. The lobbyists of the finance industry amount to five per congressperson. In other words, they pay, pay five people for every congressman to explain to them, persuade them, that they should pass legislation that is favorable to the financial industry. Obviously, the poor people who are devastated don't have the money. They couldn't hire five per congressman. So the way our, our democracy works, it's an unlevel playing field. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously the direct money through campaign contributions, but it's also the indirect influence through ideas. One person is there day in and day out explaining trying to convince them that deregulation was the way to go. And they were duped. Uh, and the other one wasn't there to say, by the way, uh, you're wrecking the lives of millions of Americans. But governments won't be able to adopt rational policies if economists continue to shroud the facts about land and natural resources in myths. Then there are major universities. Let's take Princeton University. One of its outstanding economists is quoted in the papers uh, every week. He has a textbook in which he says that rent is only 1% of the national income. This chap is a very liberal, a very public-minded person. In fact, Republicans regard him as a menace. He's so radical. But when it comes to economic rent, he puts in his book that it's just 1% of national income and therefore not worth thinking about as a source of revenue. Our world is out of control, the legacy of the West's dirty secret. Las Vegas, the desert city built on a mirage, the mecca for gamblers who dream of jackpots. High rollers risk their stakes on the roulette wheel, but governments are the biggest risk takers, allowing people's homes to be used as chips gambling that their policies will keep the economy growing. When the house of cards collapses, dreams disappear into the desert sands. In California, the gamble was called Proposition 13. This placed a legal limit on the revenue that could be raised when people's homes are taxed. But governments need money to build or repair highways and schools. Now, since we passed Proposition 13, we can't raise it from the property tax. And this is one of the main reasons we have uh, the highest income tax, the highest sales tax, and the highest uh, various kinds of social overhead costs for labor <coughs> imposed on employers of any state in the union, all of which is uh, helping drive people and industry away from the state. California suffered one of the deepest collapses in house prices. The state's terminator governor, Hollywood actor Arnold Schwarzenegger, couldn't save government from bankruptcy. Casino capitalism breeds poverty and destroys wealth, but governments turn blind eyes on the causes of property boom busts. The collapse actually began in residential streets across America and Europe. Lives are shattered when people speculate in property. Governments want us to believe that the credit crunch is something new, but the insane practices of real estate, which manifest themselves in different forms, have been with us for 200 years. For hundreds of years, the one activity common to all business crises 
was land speculation. Land attracted speculators because its value rises faster than income from working or from investing in man-made capital. In 1776, Adam Smith revealed the secret of the land market. Every improvement in the circumstances of the society tends either directly or indirectly to raise the real rent of land, to increase the real wealth of the landlord. Adam Smith identified the trend that remains with us to this day. A greater portion of the nation's income must, consequently, belong to the landlord. This gave overwhelming economic power to the idle rich. Smith called that class the public enemy. The landowner acts always as a monopolist and exacts the greatest rent that can be got for the use of his land. Conflict capitalism survived until the balance between producers and predators snapped in the 1980s. Millions of wage earners were persuaded to become predators. Margaret Thatcher in Britain and Ronald Reagan in the United States lured people into the ranks of the property-owning democracy. So popular is our policy that is being taken up all over the world, from France to the Philippines, from Jamaica to Japan, from Malaysia to Mexico, from Sri Lanka to Singapore. Privatization is on the move. And there's even a special oriental version in China. <laughs> the policies we have pioneered are catching on in country after country. We conservatives believe in popular capitalism, believe in a property-owning democracy, and it works. People stopped saving because economists told them the rising value of their homes was the nest egg for their retirement years. But the house of cards was built on debt. The boom-bust cycle repeats itself like clockwork. In the 19th century, America's bankers became the new financial aristocracy, using railways to make fortunes by tapping the vast natural resources of the continent. In the 1930s, one man embarked on a mission to track down the causes of property boom-busts. Homer Hoyt chronicled the value of land in Chicago over 100 years. He discovered that business cycles lasted for an average of 18 years. Armed with this knowledge, Hoyt helped developers build urban America. But then he turned himself into a speculator, buying vacant parcels of land around Washington. He even took to the air in a biplane, flying along the Florida coast to search for prime vacant locations. One day, he would pocket the capital gains. Governments are not planning to terminate those property cycles. The West entrepreneurs need to prepare for the clash with the titans of the East, because tighter regulation of the banking system will not prevent the next property boom-bust. The foundations for that boom are being laid in suburbs across Florida. Property speculators are plotting even larger developments for what they hope will be the good times on the other side of these sand dunes. The shift in taxation is the key clause in a new social contract which would overturn five centuries of political betrayal by kings and politicians who are supposed to be the guardians of people's wealth and welfare. Henry VIII famous for his six wives and executing two of them. But Henry's biggest atrocity was the theft of land. He demolished a religious life that existed for a thousand years and impoverished the people of England. Henry created the modern state in his personal image. He triggered the first great land privatisation in the history of England. But in squandering the rents on luxury living, Henry and his successors exposed the sovereign freedoms of the nation to a class of people, the aristocracy, who put their private interests first. Now, what has that history to do with the charge of treason? The legitimacy of those kings and queens and the politicians who followed them rested on their duty to protect the security and the welfare of the nation. In repeatedly betraying that duty, they were guilty of acts of treason. And that charge of treason can be levelled against many governments in the 21st century. Once the aristocracy acquired a share of Henry's land, England's fate was sealed. The culture of land grabbing sent the ship of state on a course of plunder. But some statesmen inside the Mother of Parliaments had the courage to name the culprits. Edmund Burke, one of Britain's greatest historians, denounced Henry as a tyrant. One of the most decided tyrants in the roles of history who bribed the members of his two servile houses with a share of the spoils and, 
holding out to them an eternal immunity from taxation, to demand a confirmation of his iniquitous proceedings by an act of Parliament. Henry defended himself by charging other people with treason. But, wrote Burke, it was those kings and queens and the politicians who followed them who violated people's common rights to land. Solving the crises of the 21st century begins with reforms to the way governments raise revenue. Adam Smith explained that to achieve efficiency and fairness, a modern economy needed to tax land. Instead, Parliament invented the income tax. Adam Smith's land tax was popularised by Henry George. Writing in Progress and Poverty, he explained that poverty and unemployment were inevitable when people were deprived of their share of the rent of land. Henry George uh, was extremely popular in his day. His book, Progress and Poverty, outsold every other book except the Bible and was translated into all languages. But the economists and the, the landed interests that, that they represented, the vested interests, managed to create an image of Henry George as a kind of kook. Landowners want to disguise the social character of the revenue from land. But it was this revenue that converted communities from the edge of subsistence into flourishing societies, beginning with the ancient city civilizations in Mesopotamia. At the beginning of the 20th century, Britain's parliament enacted a law to shift taxes from wages. Lloyd George and Winston Churchill wanted to fund the needs of the sick, the aged and unemployed, out of the rent of land. The landlords fought back. Lord Selborne denounced Churchill as a malignant lunatic. This tax shift is the key clause in a new social contract. With that tax reform in place, people's trust in government would be restored. Why? Because government would be forced by the people to tailor its spending according to the rents that we, the people, were prepared to pay for the public services that we want. But time for a new social contract is running out. China, rich in cash and low-cost labour, will capture an ever-growing share of the global markets. Without tax reform, a weakened West cannot compete with the Orient. The West's future will be even bleaker if China discovers Hong Kong's money-making secret. As a British colony, Hong Kong raised its revenue by using Adam Smith's land tax. Land was leased by merchants. Trade flourished. Merchants paid rent to the colonial government, so taxes on wages and profits could be kept low. Today, Hong Kong is the most dynamic, prosperous and free market economy in the world. If China adopts Hong Kong's financial model, it would land a fatal blow on the economies of Europe and North America. We can't blame China for the social crisis in the making because Western governments refuse to prevent the next round of land speculation. This means the prospects are grave because a weakened West will not be able to claw back its share of the global markets. Whole regions will suffer, betrayed by the politicians who should have protected their people. The standard economic thinking says that you can achieve efficiency from any starting point. But in practice, that's not true. In order to achieve efficiency, in order to get the pricing institutions that motivate people to use resources efficiently, you have to first take taxes off of productive activities. And secondly, you have to make sure that people have enough in the way of opportunities, that you don't mind charging them for the cost of all their choices. So efficiency means pricing the environment correctly, uh, pricing uh, all the things we use correctly, and rewarding people appropriately for the work that they do. And the basis on which to do that is to say that we're going to share the revenue from the use of the earth equally and then allow people to keep what they 
produce. And the most uh, important element of a tax system is to do what uh, everybody expected to be done in the 19th century, and that is to base the tax system on land taxation, on the free lunch of land value, on natural monopolies, uh, and on what John Stuart Mill called the unearned increment, uh, the income that landlords made in their sleep, as he put it. Uh, and if the governments uh, ta used this land site value that's supplied by nature, not by human la labor, not by a personal enterprise, then uh, the government would not have to tax uh, wages in the form of income tax. It wouldn't have to imply sales tax that add to the price of doing business, and it wouldn't have to uh, add the proliferation of business taxes. And I think that people, once they understand and open their minds to this, do think that raising more revenue from land and less from effort and less from sales and less from uh, production makes sense to them. I mean, just think about it yourself. If you could see uh, avoiding income taxes uh, and having that money to spend, we'd have a much more prosperous economy. When you spend it, if you could avoid sales taxes, uh, we'd have a more prosperous economy. And when we can raise the same amount of revenue from a source that's non-distortionary, one that's equitable, which is land, one which has basically produced the value from the community, it only makes sense to reduce on effort and production as much as possible. So over a period of time, hopefully, as democracy is strengthened and people get to recognize issues, the correct economic and financial policies on regard to land taxation will also evolve. The annual losses of income from today's taxes are enormous. I estimate that it costs the American economy about $800 billion a year to have the taxes that we have. That's $5,000 per worker. If we were to finance the government instead by taxes on land and other sources of revenue that don't have an excess burden, the long run effect would be a higher growth rate, not just the $5,000 per worker per year, but significantly more every year, more and more every year, because of the higher growth path that we would be on. Parliaments are bound by law to protect the welfare and the wealth of the people of their nations. But they conspired to molest people's common rights. This was the treason against the sovereignty of the people, which even blighted the politics of democratic governance. This economic crisis began as a financial crisis when banks and financial institutions took huge, reckless risks in pursuit of quick profits and massive bonuses. The economic crisis actually began in Baltimore, USA and Birmingham, England and in the streets from Madrid to Mumbai, from Shanghai to Dublin caused by the unsustainable rise in house prices. The bonuses of bankers were dwarfed by fortunes made by land speculators. We have to enact common sense reforms that will protect American taxpayers and the American economy from future crises as well. Re-regulating the banks will not prevent the next financial crisis. Banking crises occur under weak regulation, tough regulation and no regulation. Never again will the American taxpayer be held hostage by a bank that is too big to fail. The next banking crisis and bailout will follow the property boom of 2020. But what we've seen so far in recent weeks is an army of industry lobbyists from Wall Street descending on Capitol Hill to try and block basic and common sense rules of the road that would protect our economy and the American people. So, if these folks want a fight, it's a fight I'm ready to have. Fighting bankers won't alter the incentives that drive reckless speculation when people scramble to make money out of land. We simply cannot return to business as usual. The next bubble in real estate has begun. House prices in China soared in 2010. Global business will crash again in 2028 because governments refuse to abolish the bad taxes and reform the way we pay for the services we share in common.